Okay. Namaste, everyone. Namaste. Welcome. Namaste. So, dharmasar means the essence of dharma. Now, what is dharma? Some people think it means religious, morality, or rituals, or dogma, or doctrines. But actually, it has a deeper meaning, which is the essence of the way things are. Not only the way things are, but why they are the way they are. So one who really understands Dharma or the essence of Dharma understands the way things are and why they are the way they are. So we uh, use the Western science of ontology to analyze various spiritual paths and methods and create an inclusive context. In other words, we don't say, well, we believe this, and anybody who doesn't believe this is wrong. Uh, we don't say that. What we say is, there is a large context of spirituality, which includes all states of being and all states of consciousness. And the spiritual path connects them all. There is a logical progression and growth or evolution, development of consciousness from the lowest to the highest. And in that development, which is called the path, every state of being and every state of consciousness is represented. So, of course, in the various religions, they speak to certain populations or certain groups of the humanity. People have different needs, different tastes, different activities, different aspirations. So there are many religions, many spiritual paths, many methods. But ultimately, in the final analysis, truth is one. And in the Vedas, that one is called Brahman. In the Buddhist teaching, it's called Nibbana. And in other teachings, it's called other different names. But it's the same thing. The highest stage of enlightenment. And generally, the founders of the great world religions have been in that state of being. They may express it differently. They may have uh, different manifestations in their personal lives. But all of that is secondary to the consciousness, the realization of the absolute. And that is always the same, everywhere and in everyone. So, Dharma Sar, then, is the context or background that includes all these different states, all these different paths and methods, all these different ideas about spiritual life, which occur naturally at different stages of the path. And we have formalized that, or actually Adi Shankaracharya formalized it, into four levels, or actually five, that before one comes to spiritual life consciously, one is more or less like an animal, pashu. So the pashus, pashu means rope, because an animal has to be controlled with a rope. So the pashus have to be controlled by governments and laws and economics and social uh, mechanisms, morality and stuff like that. But then 
The higher stages are the yogins. Yoga means to connect, to hook up two things together. So those in the first level are called karma yogins. Karma yoga means the creation of good karma. Because karma in yoga means a connection with the Supreme. So one who develops the activities and their results that lead eventually to enlightenment is a karma yogi. And when this stage is mature, when one has a sufficient amount of punya, which is compared some, in some writings to like a bank balance of good karma, when you have enough in the bank, <laughs> then spontaneously bhakti yoga arises and bhakti is based on love. So in karma yoga, the activities are guided by uh, scriptural rules and regulations and by teachings of the guru and so on. But in bhakti yoga, the love which arises is spontaneous. It has to be because nobody can force love. Either it happens or it doesn't. <laughs> so by continual performance of karma yoga, one matures to the stage of bhakti. And similarly, by mature performance of bhakti yoga, then raja yoga or dhyana yoga arises spontaneously. Meditation. And the Buddha taught meditation as his primary teaching. Um, but there's also, of course, extensive literature on meditation in the Vedic tradition. And the difference is the Vedic tradition uses mostly positive language. They talk about Brahman or God or Samadhi, whereas the Buddha's teaching uses negative language. He talks about emptiness, shunyata, or uh, nothingness, or nibbana, which means extinguishment. But in any case, the final result of the meditations is a realization of nothingness, that the individual ego really doesn't exist. It's just an appearance created by the mind. This world, this body, all of our activities and so on are simply appearances like a mirage in the desert. In the desert, we may see what appears to be water off in the distance. But if we go there, we find there's no water. It just looked like water. So this is the material world, maya, that which is not. It's simply an appearance in the mind. And so when this appearance is penetrated, just like if we go in the desert, to where we thought we saw water, we find there's no water. So in the same way, when the mind is penetrated by meditation, we find actually there is no mind. <laughs> there is no ego. There is no world. There is only the self. And so Ramana Maharshi taught that the self is already there within everyone. It's not something we have to add or get. It's already our self. All we have to do is remove the coverings that prevent us from realizing this. So all the different processes of yoga, all the different um, exercises of karma, and the devotional moods of bhakti and the meditations of Raja Yoga are all simply to remove the coverings, the, the kleshas or the upadis that cover this self, the reality. And uh, when this happens, we automatically attain or we automatically realize enlightenment. 
It's not that we have to go anywhere or get anything or make something happen. It's already there. We simply have to remove the illusion and enlightenment is spontaneous and immediate. So the Dharmasar teaching, essence of Dharma, is about this special context that gives meaning to the different uh, yoga practices, the different religions, uh, and it's inclusive. It inc has a place for them all. So we're non-sectarian and we're non-religious, but we find that this orientation allows us to um, resolve all the apparent contradictions between the different religions. Because we find that some of them focus on karma yoga, some focus on bhakti, some on raja yoga, and so on. And the top is jnana. Jnana means realization, realized knowledge, direct knowledge of the truth. And this is the dharma sara, the essence of dharma. So, are there any questions? And if you have questions, just unmute yourself and ask, please. Hi, uh, Swamiji. I'm very interested in the Devi worship. That's how I came across your YouTube. So I was listening to the uh, Lakshmi uh, Tantra and all. So it gives me deeper understanding. So I went into it. Then I heard the the uh, sound because I'm interested in the uh, the sh the shabda the the, the nada uh, the uh, bindu and the kala. i actually wanted to learn all these things. I I have teachings on this on a very high level. I'm on a low level, so I want to go step by step and learn. Huh. I've been listening to you every day, so I'm learning a lot of Sanskrit from you too, but they are very high-level teachers that I'm taking from, but I need to go back to basic <laughs> and learn and go out because I got a background from uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I've been following Hinduism, but there are all the things that they assume I know, but I don't know, so I'm going back to basic. Where to start? Well, if you're interested in the path of the goddess, uh, you can read Srimad Devi Bhagavatam. We have it on our uh, site. I'm not sure how to post a link here. I'll have to post no. it later. Post it on the chat? I'll post I, it in I, the comments. Yes, I actually have the initiation into the shoulder seat. I'm interested in this kind of things, but I think I'm looking for this kind of teachings on the on the deeper level where I can understand basic on a deeper level because I've been hearing all these things. I know there's something, but what is it? So I've been listening to you every night. So I say, hey, I'm learning a lot of things. So I say, I must come tonight and meet you. I understand. That's why I recommended Srimad Devi Bhagavatam. It contains all the origin stories of all the beliefs in Shakti. It gives the background. It gives the context of the Shakti worship. And uh, when you read that, you'll understand where this is coming from. So I very strongly recommend that you read it. Um, I'll post a link in the comments of this video. Once we make a video and post it on the channel, I'll post a link to the book in the comments. It's a two-part book, very big book. 
I have put my email there. My email is on the uh, chat now. Oh, I can also send it to you. But it, if I post it as a comment, everyone will see it. If I send it to you, only you will see it. Yes. So that's why I'm suggesting to, to put it in the comments once we edit this and post it on the channel. Yes. Because when I listen to you, then I suddenly realize, oh, now I know why I'm God. <laughs> because of this, the, the five koshas, this pranamaya, uh, this uh, anamaya kosha, it, it will be destroyed, but the other koshas remain. So that one, that on that aspect, I was God. I was listening to Swamiji say, how can I be God when I have so much maya, so much delusion? So when I listen to, oh, the six koshas, oh, now I understand because I there are a lot of teachings I am listening to, but I feel that one level is missing. So I'm looking for that level just to fill up the gap so that I can go further. Well, you can find everything in Srimad Devi Bhagavatam. It's so deep. Oh, it's so rich. And it's so um, beautiful. Even listening to you read every, every day on the Lakshmi Tantra. I listen, it's so beautiful, all the dialogues and all. Lakshmi Tantra is deep too, but it's more advanced. Srimad Devi yeah. Bhagavatam is, is exactly what you're asking for. It's the basic teaching of the goddess path. So I... I listen to it every evening. Whatever I don't understand, never mind. Just put it in the mind first. Somehow something will come out later. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you read that, a lot of things will become clear. So many things. I, I was really looking for it. I see then suddenly I see, oh, my desire has been manifested. So I look for it. It's something that I want. To, I want something specific. And if you read it, then in the next session, you can ask questions about what you're reading. I'm asking questions of where they get the text. <laughs> oh, I'm going to post the link on, on the comments. I have it in my online library. Okay. Yes, thank you, Swamiji. Yes. Okay. So, what else we got? Uh, namaste, Swamiji. This is Kartik here. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, Swamiji, um, my question to you is similar to uh, what uh, uh, Lee had asked, actually. I just need one Devi Mantra. Um, uh, I uh, currently am in Trivannamalai. If you can suggest me somebody who can initiate me um, into one of Devi Mantra, give me initiation. Um, I can go and I want to practice that and meditate upon on that mantra. Yes. I recommend the Mahasodashi Mantra. Mahashodashi. Okay. There's a whole series on it on our channel. And there's yes. also an email address you can write. And a fellow named Santosh. And uh, he's, uh, he's in our line of uh, uh, Devi worshippers. And he will initiate you. It's a three-step process. You start okay. with the Siddha man Siddhi Mantra. Then there's the, uh, there's another mantra, I forget what it's called. And then there's the Shodashi mantra. Okay. Um, the reason for this is the Atma Bija, the, the Bija syllable that represents you, has to be calculated astrologically. And I don't know how to do that. He does. Okay. So you write him and he will calculate your bija, uh, your atma bija. And then you can start chanting the Siddha mantra. And um, once that, that's really the reason for that is to test 
whether the Atma Bija is correct. Because okay. there's actually uh, two or three possibilities, you know. So to choose the right one, you have to test it. And then um, that's bugging me. I can't remember the second mantra. It's the young goddess. Um, Bala Tripuri Sundari. Bala mantra. Bala mantra. Yeah. Yeah. So the the Bala mantra is next, and then after some time chanting that, uh, because it involves the bija sao. Sao is a very powerful bija. So uh, you should chant that for some time and then start the Maha Shodashi mantra. Yeah, we have a whole series on it. I can also post that on the, as a comment. Sure, but, uh, If you look it up, Maha Shodashi on our channel. Yes. So that's the best mantra. I mean, really, I've chanted so many mantras in my life. <laughs> But Mahashodasi gave me everything that I ever wanted. So I highly recommend it. Sure, Swamiji. Thank you very much. I will write to you uh, regarding this. Thank you very much. Okay. How's things going? Still only five of us. Oh, well, it's a small meeting, huh? Swamiji, can I ask a question? When, That's what we're here for. Yeah, when I saw your earlier video videos, you don't look so good. Now you look better. Was it because of Devi worship? Because your previous videos, you don't look so healthy. Now you look very vibrant. Yes. Worshipping goddess gives good health because she is the life energy, kundalini, the source of prana. So when the prana is circulating freely in the body, automatically one gets good health. And by worshipping the goddess, then the prana is uh, stimulated she becomes aroused and she uh, circulates through the body and makes the health very good. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. My health was uh, some problem before. I had COVID twice. Not bad, but uh, it was about two years ago and about one year ago. I had the alpha and the delta. But even before that, uh, I wasn't happy. And the reason I wasn't happy was I felt that something was missing from my self-realization. Even though I had gone through all the four path realizations, and even though I had practiced karma and bhakti yoga for many years, uh, I still felt something was missing. And... <laughs> You know, because she came to me in 1984 and gave me first path. And then after that, I kind of lost touch with her. Um, but when I first came to Tiruvannamalai, my driver, my auto rickshaw driver, his guru spontaneously came and visited me. And it turned out he was a Shakta, a devotee of the Shakti. And so one thing led to another. <laughs> and he initiated me. He, he was the one who gave me sannyas. So just before he left his body, about four months before, he gave me sannyas. And um, ever since then, I've been very deeply involved in worshiping the goddess. You know, you'll see, if you look back in my videos, about uh, three years, a little more, maybe, three and a half years, uh, the ontology of the goddess, I think is the first series I did on Sri Vidya. 
Um, so ever since then, I've been more and more engrossed in her worship, and especially the Maha Sodashi Mantra has brought me deeper and deeper into union with her. And uh, she appears in my dreams and teaches me. Um, my health is improved. Everything is improved. <laughs> she will bring you to the feet of Shiva. That's the overall effect. That's what I wanted, Swamiji, because I follow a big group under Nitya and uh, I, I wanted some specialized teachings for myself. If it's group, you know, group is still group, but we still go for certain things that I wanted. And I wanted this. So I was looking through all your videos. I was listening to the one on sacred sound. And I find that when I chant sa, I cannot reach because halfway my my prana just broke off. I, I don't have such long breath because I just gone through a cryon ablation for heart uh, for atrial vibration and of the heart, irregular heartbeat. So I had panting. My breath is atrial, atrial, atrial vibration is irregular heartbeat. So I listened to your video on Sahawe. I just broke off. I cannot chant. It's very release. Well, you have to do that. It, it, you won't master it in one day. You have to practice it consistently. Not, not a lot, just 10 or 15 minutes a day. But it may take, you know, a couple of months to uh, where you can chant it nice and steady. So, even I'm, I'm out of practice. <laughs> but um, when you can completely merge your vibration with the sa, then, I mean, it's the most wonderful thing. It's like merging with Brahman. Uh, and you feel this current of energy in your body, which is from the prana, which is going through, penetrating all the blockages. See, if there's some um, fibrillation, fibrillation in the heart, it's because the flow of the prana is interrupted. And the same yes. with any disease. So by removing the blockages in the chakras by this vibration, then the prana will flow smoothly. This is why practice of music is so highly recommended in spiritual life. Chanting, bhajans, mantras, you know, uh, with music, because the harmony between the, the sound of the music and the sound of your voice creates a special relationship of frequencies called swara. Swara. Sa, ri, ga, ma, pa, da, di, sa. Okay, so all these are swaras. And the swara has a special mathematical uh, formula, which is that it's a ratio of vibrations of whole numbers integral number, integers, whole numbers, like one to two, two to three, three to four, like that. So when these vibrations meet, they create a stable interference pattern in the atmosphere. And then this creates like a field where the product can flow harmoniously without any breaks. And so this is what you need. The, the uh, fibrillation is caused by the mind, ultimately by the mind jumping too much and vibrating between different things that are not in harmony. So by chanting the sa especially, but you know also sa, Gama pa. These swaras are very powerful to regulate the prana. 
and, and align the chakras. So yeah, sound vibration is, uh, well, there's your whole yoga called Nod Yoga, which is uh, developed by musicians, of course. <laughs> And so the, the Nada yogis are generally musicians. And uh, they practice this science of sound. And of course, they're all very healthy. So this is highly recommended. But you, you need the training. So you have to sit down with somebody who's mastered this. And they can show you how to do it. Simply giving you verbal description is not too helpful. It's it's very difficult to get started with it. But if you if you chant the sa, you have to have a steady tone, like uh, tanpura, sound of a tanpura. But um, if you chant along with it, here I'll get one here. Then uh, this would be very helpful for your condition. Did you have any other questions? Well, I'm waiting for this thing to boot up. We chant Om, is it, does it have the same effect too? Oh, yes. But all mantras, any Vedic mantras, should be chanted with a drone, like this. This is not my key. the practice. Swamiji, perhaps you can post a link to that uh, music to help her. Which music? What you're chanting to right now. Oh, I'm just chanting Suarez. But the drone in the background. Oh, the drone in the background. Yes. Oh, well, that's an idea. Um, I think I have several already uploaded. I can just... Uh, post a link. Good. But anyway, that's the practice. And, re and really, any mantra should be chanted with a drone. Is it a daimaru? Is it Sorry? a daimaru? Is it a daimaru? The two ended drums? Oh, this is, uh, well, it's sim similar to the daimaru. Uh -huh. I have a it's a Pura. Oh. oh, really? Yeah, but I I have a Daimaru from uh, Kashi. 
I mean, I I told you, I come cool. to India every year except uh 2018 when COVID start. I did not come to India. I've been yeah, coming right. to India since 2010 every year. Oh, great, great. So yeah, you could use a damaru or you can use an electronic sound. I'll post a link. Somebody better be keeping track because I can't remember all these links I'm supposed to post. <laughs> Richard, can you be the secretary? <laughs> the link tracker? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's any mantra. Like when I chant, when I chant Shodashi mantra, let's start this again. Shrim ring cling I'm so King ring shrim Kaila ring Asaka hala ring Sakala ring Saho I'm cling ring shrim You see, so all mantras assume the presence of a drone because there's three elements in mantras. There's the mantra, the text. There's the matra, which is the rhythm. And there's the swara, which means the, the interval or the tone. And swara is always measured compared to a drone. So the, the rhythm and the, the melody and the text, these are the three elements of mantra that have to be correct for it to be effective. So I, I know most teachers don't teach these things because it's so technical, but I have to be honest, if you really want these mantras to work, that's how you do it. But that's the old way, that's the complete way. I, I've been following big groups. I find that I need personalized teachings. So I saw your video. I say I must come in and, and I have something that a lot of things I did not know you were telling me. So I said I, it's I want, always better to have always better to have individual instruction. Yes. Always. And I find because that in I, a group, you know, the group is always limited by the slowest person. Mass production. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just feel that, okay, I did progress from knowing nothing to knowing something, but I want specific. I don't want to <laughs> be a product of mass production. <laughs> I understand. You, you have particular questions, and in a group, they, they may not be appropriate, you know, or there may not be time or so many other things. So uh, you need a one-on-one. -on -one. It's too much collective why, consciousness. And why, not come, why, not, why not come and visit me in Sri Lanka? Oh. <laughs> Can I travel now? <laughs> yeah, I came here. I came from <laughs> India a month ago. I just see what I can do. Uh, I'll check. Instead of going to <laughs> instead of going to India, go go to Sri Lanka and we can meet, spend a couple of weeks every day, a couple hours a day. I can show you all these practices. Colombo, is it? Are you in Colombo? I'm, I'm I'm near Colombo. I'm north of Colombo, uh, a small town near the airport. I I have a friend who was working with the Colombo plan. Uh, he's they are back in Malaysia. Maybe I can ask her. What to ask? How, how can, to come? <laughs> the condition. Oh, you can come. You're from Malaysia? Yes, I'm from Malaysia. You, you, can, get, you can get direct flight. There's direct flights from Malaysia. Yes. Kuala Lumpur. 
Yes. Kuala yeah, Lumpur. You can come directly. You can come fly directly to Colombo. And my place is like 20 minutes away from the airport. Oh. So anyway, look into it. And, uh, you know, instead of going to India, you could come here. Yeah, because I just feel in my in my in group practices, there's so you know when everybody has the same idea. When you differ, then they say, "Oh, you are you don't have bhakti." <laughs> I, I think that is not correct because this collective shaming and group idea. I feel that at my level, I do not want to follow what you follow. I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> group think. See, this is why I will never start an organization. I've had too much experience like that, being with a group and being held back because I'm, what can I say? I'm a fast learner. I pick up things, you know, very fast. Um, so most groups move way too slow for me. The amount of information is too less, you know, too too little for me. I get bored. Or like you said, I'll have a certain question, but it doesn't fit with the agenda of the group. And then they start giving me trouble. Oh boy. <laughs> Shaming. So and, um uh, yeah, I feel that. That sometimes the guru may be good, but I think this is something that I want something more specific and not, I think the next word I would not say. <laughs> I totally understand. And I totally agree that, well, for example, in the Upanishads, there are several stories of a disciple approaching a guru. And it's always an individual thing. They never taught in groups. The one individual would come, ask questions, and there would be a conversation back and forth. That is the actual Vedic way of teaching. This group thing is something new. I think it comes from Christianity. They like to have groups because it's so political. And again, this is uh, a chance to interact with Swamiji, and I've found that these are really special opportunities and a good way, I think, for me to approach it is what if this was the last chance you had to talk to someone like Swamiji, what would you ask him then if this is a precious moment? Because it is a precious moment. And so take advantage of it. Uh, Namaste, Swamiji. Uh, I would like to ask this question. Uh, I have understood that ignorance is what it creates rebirth. Uh, because of ignorance, we are having that rebirth. If ignorance is cut down, we will not have that rebirth. So, um, so once we die, actually, before taking up that body, uh, another body, uh, what, uh, how to actually uh, uh, come out of it, and how to merge with the divine at that time? We will, will we have that uh, option, or how to do that? Actually, uh, will it happen spontaneously, or how will that happen? Well, it doesn't happen spontaneously. Um, it happens because we prepare our whole life for that moment of death. You know that shloka in Bhagavad Gita, Yam Yam Bhapi Sparan Bhava, Tyajitante Kalevaram, Tang Tang Evaiti Kanteya, Sadata Bhava Bhavitaha. That whatever we are thinking or whatever is our state of mind or state of being at the time of death, that is the state we attain in the next life. 
And, and Krishna says, uh, this is certain, Eva. This is certain. So, in other words, there's nothing we can do at the time of death. By the time death actually comes, everything is already determined by higher authorities, by karma, and by our own minds. And uh, so what happens at the time of death is called life review. The entire previous life flashes before your eyes like a tape that, that's being rewound very fast. And what's happening is that the memories, the impressions in the mind from this life are being compressed. You know, it's like making a backup of a computer. All the data is compressed and then it's written into a seed. And that seed becomes the karmic generator of the next life. So in other words, the impressions that we create on a day-to-day -day basis during this life are then replayed very quickly at the time of death and create the state of mind that leads to the next body. So what we do, what we think, the intentions that we make, the associations that we have, Everything about the present life is what prepares the next life. That is why we should do daily sadhana, not just on special occasions or, you know, religious holidays or uh, special days like marriage or whatever, but every day. We should do some spiritual practice and if possible, we should dedicate our whole life to spiritual practice. Because then all the impressions will be of spiritual quality, and that will lead to spiritual state of being in the next life. See, so for example, someone like Ramana Maharshi, who became enlightened very easily without any much practice, uh, at the early age means either he was a special being like an avatar, which is quite, quite possible, or he had already created in the previous life all the impressions needed to qualify for enlightenment in this life. And then as soon as he attained a little uh, majority, then boom, immediately recalled everything from previous life. And you'll find that also if you look into astrology, that especially um, K2 is bringing uh, all the realizations from the previous life. So things happen almost effortlessly. Uh, like for example, in my case, in 1984, I attained first path. And this was actually during the K2 return. K2 was conjunct my natal Jupiter in the ninth house in Scorpio, Prishika. So almost effortlessly, with very little preparation, I attained a high state of enlightenment, or actually it was given to me because I had already qualified for it in the previous life. And you see, this can happen in anybody's life, uh, either for good or for ill, that the results of the previous life will manifest in this life and will bring them, you know, whatever they deserve, whatever they have earned by creating impressions. You know, it said, a saint in truth is a saint in youth. This is because it means in previous life, they already qualified. They already became uh, advanced, if not already enlightened. So in this life, they have very little karma. 
their personality, their their illusion is very thin. They easily see through it. And so they don't have to struggle. They don't have to work very hard. But enlightenment comes like automatically. So this is the secret. Well, it's not a secret. <laughs> it's an open instruction in the Shastra that you spend as much time every day in spiritual practices, in study, in puja, in mantra, and in contemplation of the truth, meditation, uh, uh, as much spiritual practice as you possibly can. And that way, at the end of this life, automatically you remember all these things. And in the next life, you get a higher birth. That's how it works. Thank you, Swamiji. Now, we are at the end of today's session. So thank you all for joining us. And we will be back next week. And we invite you to come and continue your dialogue with Swamiji. So namaste. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti. Om Shakti. Om.